In this video, we're going to focus on the voltage controlled routers inside the double helix, because that's how you do all of your modulation. In the process, we're going to also study the different waveforms that come with the oscillators, focusing on the primary oscillator. First, let's look at the sine wave, because that's what we were using for the modulation earlier on. When you look at the spectrograph display, you'll see that it actually has far more harmonics than you might expect for a sine wave. And if you look really closely at the data's display, you'll see that the sine wave is a bit piecemeal. Now the purist may say a sine wave should only have the fundamental harmonic, and sometimes I prefer that too when doing things like ring modulation, but honestly, I like having the option of a sine wave that has a few more harmonics with it and a bit more character, particularly since the double helix does not have triangle waveforms. Therefore, the sine wave kind of fills the role of a triangle in that it has a strong fundamental and a few higher harmonics. By the way, if you're curious, the sine wave is normaled to the wave folder over in the contour section, and if we were to look at that output, we see that it has even more kinks in it than the straight sine wave out of the oscillator. That's fine, because the whole point of that is to make interesting sounds. It has a sawtooth wave, a pretty classic distribution of harmonics, and we measure the spacing for these, the fundamental right now, I have tuned it to roughly one octave below middle C, and occasionally we do see a subharmonic pop up here. As I mentioned before, the double helix is not the cleanest, most clinical oscillator in the world. And again, I don't mind a bit of character. Here you see a second harmonic, and every now and then an in-between harmonic does pop up. So you are going to get more richness and more intermodulation distortion out of the double helix. I'm going to look at the sub-octave briefly. It's basically just a square wave at half the frequency of the fundamental. It's pretty good at having just odd harmonics. There's a fundamental around 67. There's third harmonic 202, roughly three times the fundamental third harmonic. Very tiny peak of an occasional even harmonic. It's actually hard to find a square wave that is pure and has only odd harmonics. So this is not unexpected, particularly if the wave shape or the width of that square is wandering around a little bit. Now let's go look at the pulse wave, and I'm going to be spending some time in particular on the blade. The pulse wave starts out at roughly 50% width or duty cycle. You see that we do have that sub-octave and some additional harmonics built in, just like we saw with the sawtooth. And we do see some even harmonics present that you'll get if the waveform is not completely symmetrical. There's a couple of ways of changing the width of that square wave. They all come through this blade pulse control voltage amount. This knob regulates whatever is coming from the modulation section of the double helix and uses that to control the symmetry of both the blade wave, which is a modified sawtooth, and the pulse. I can say, let's take the blade pulse CV from modulation input B, which happens to be normaled to the sine wave coming out of the built-in LFO. One of the nice things about the double helix is in addition to two oscillators, it has a third oscillator, an LFO built in. To get any of this default modulation, I need to turn up its amount. This is actually a VCA, which can be controlled by this additional jack here, and then turn up the control voltage amount for the modulation depth gives me a bipolar offset to that pulse width parameter. I said a little faster if I like, get a chorus sound. And I find that the pulse width is very touchy on this module, so I might want to go to a lower amount like that, just to get my chorusing sound. It defaults to the sine wave out from the LFO, but I can override that by patching around it. For example, I can take the square wave out, patch that into the input of the B modulation bus. That's now routed through this pot into this section for the blade and pulse with CV, and finally through this depth. The double helix is a bit odd that you don't have a dedicated pot just to set the pulse width, just the CV amount, and then you need to send something to it. We have that square wave output. We have a random output. It's kind of like a sample and hold output. And finally, we have a noise output. If you want to add some uncertainty or a bit of haze or fuzz to your sound, this is particularly useful when we're modulating other parameters. The default is that sine wave. In addition to this input on the B bus, we also have a direct input jack for modulating the blade and pulse CV, 
as well as all of these other parameters that can be modulated inside the double helix. So if I wanted to, I could grab a bias voltage, just a constant DC voltage, plug it into the blade CV, turn down the normal send from the LFO, and instead use this control to set my pulse width. That's just a positive voltage, and I can switch this to giving a negative voltage. I can increase the CV mount to get the desired depth. In fact, I can turn this up all the way to 100%. I've now gone beyond 100% width. I can back that off. By carefully controlling my external CV coming into that direct modulation input. The pulse width, as I mentioned before, is very touchy. It only needs plus or minus two volts or so to go plus or minus 90%. I'll turn that back down to zero for now. Finally, I can use external signals such as envelopes to replace the internal LFO being routed through this B bus. Overriding the input for these modulation buses come in particularly handy when we're controlling the contour section. In addition to the pulse width, we also have this blade section, which is particularly interesting. It's a modified noisy sawtooth with no modulation depth. By default, it's at roughly double the frequency of our normal sawtooth wave. You notice it's reversed as well. And when we look at the spectrograph, we see that it has a lot of extra harmonics. There's our fundamental. The second harmonic is actually stronger. That's because it is doubled in frequency. And we do have, have an overlay of two different sets of harmonics here. As we take our direct control voltage coming into the blaze CV and crank up its depth control, its attenuator on that input, switch this to positive voltages, we'll see how much of a range we can feed this through. With positive voltage, we can drive it all the way to being a positive going square wave. With lots of unusual harmonics in between, including a lot of noisiness. You can see this high frequency oscillation here on the data display, and you see a lot of hash and busyness in the high harmonics here. That's what makes it so much more complex than an ordinary sawtooth wave. Again, sawtooth, blade. I'll back that down, switch to a negative bias, feed that in, and go to the other extreme. There's our sawtooth wave right at the fundamental again. Actually looks pretty good there on the spectrograph display. And again, I can drive it in the other direction to a square wave. Let's take that bias out and use this built-in LFO to create some modulation of this blade. And if we want to, we can override that with a random signal just to make it a little more glitchy. or we can add even more noise to the signal. The frequency knob for the LFO has no effect on noise. Let's lower that depth. And now we have a fried sawtooth, and you can see on the spectra display quite an amount of noise mixed with the signal. But I'll take that out and go to the default sine wave and back this amount out. Now there are two modulation buses on here, A and B. B is normaled to this LFO. A is normaled to the sine wave output of the secondary oscillator. So we can very easily FM any parameter that pops up in this modulation bus, including the blade and pulse with CV. So I'll flip this up to A and start increasing the amount of that secondary oscillator. It's tuned an octave lower and you can hear that subharmonic come in and you see it on the spectrograph. I drive it to a very high FM depth, give a different sound altogether. That's quite a complex wave now by FMing the shape of the blade waveform. Now we have a very different sound. As I mentioned, these are actually controlling VCAs. There's a VCA in between this normal input and this modulation bus. So I could use something such as 
again, an envelope generator. Let's go ahead and grab this one we were playing with earlier and apply that to this modulation depth VCA. My sustain's down at zero. That's why we have no modification to the blade. When I press a key, we're now enveloping the FM depth going to the blade shape. Let's give a little bit of sustain there. So the notes come back to a slightly modified sound. A little bit of release. So some more interesting sound just for a single oscillator. But of course you can mix in other oscillators. I can bring in oscillator two, mix the mode back in. Turn the VCA back on. Quite a thick sound. Bring us a filter. This is just the Moog. This is the double helix oscillator. Bring the two together. make a lovely thick sound. So the secret to mastering the double helix oscillator and what sets it apart from other complex oscillators is this very flexible routing in the modulation bus, including some intelligent normaling, controls and VCAs to modulate the depth, and the ability to directly inject signals into the modulation bus that don't go through those VCAs. In the next few movies, we'll look at the more traditional complex oscillator sections, including frequency modulation, the wave folder, and a great bonus in this module, a built-in low-pass gate. Oh.